<laughs> that's that's totally okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have just gone live, and just to let Hi. you know that that was Satine uh, Phoenix who was looking at my incredibly boring Twitter. I'm, I'm literally account. creeping on him right now, and well, that's the uh, only way to be. Yeah. I mean, after all, like we haven't been <laughs> properly introduced. Uh, but no. speaking of which, uh, <laughs> everybody out there, thank you for for tuning in. Uh, so my name is Matt Yancic, and uh, I am the founder and, and head game master here at uh, the enormous, enormous company known as Manufactured Myth and Ledger Domain. We have scientists working around the clock, working on the best role-playing solutions for you, the viewer, the player, uh, and, and maybe the fan, maybe, maybe I don't know. Um, but at any rate, I'm also the host here of Role Player with a Thousand Faces, and each week or two on the show, I really like to have somebody on um, that I think has some cool stuff to say and maybe some some uh, really interesting perspective on not just maybe role playing, but the way that role playing fits in with with life. Um, so tonight, I am super excited to introduce to you Satine Phoenix. Um, and I was telling her before the show that my, my only problem with introducing her is that she's done so <laughs> many things, I don't even know kind of where to start. Um, so I'll give you a few things, and then she'll just probably jump in and, and help me out here. But uh, she is a Dungeons & Dragons game master, but I believe in the in, in the D&D realm they're called Dungeon Masters. Um, she's also a storytelling coach and a self-professed herald of compassion. So um, she has been, she's done shows and appeared on Geek and Sundry, uh, Tabletop with, with none other than Will Wheaton, D&D uh, &D Beyond, and I wrote in many others because there are too many others <laughs> to, like, to list. She's also uh, the co-author of The Action Heroine's Journey, which we're going to ask her a little bit about later on. Um, and uh, she's also got her own, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, she's got her own company called Gilding Light, and it focuses on uh, creating content uh, that supports and kind of encourages people of all ages and, and backgrounds and, and uh, whatnot to, to get into RPGing and, and maybe more specifically or generally to, to tell stories. Um, and most recently, I'm, I'm trying to wrap this up because I don't, this is not the, the Matt Yancic <laughs> show. Um, most recently, she has done some really great work with a Kickstarter, uh, which she, she closed out with uh, $299,000, uh, which is about the rough uh, rent on an apartment in Boston for a month. <laughs> um, so congratulations on that. She Thank was shooting you. for 20000 She got $299,000. Uh, Satine, I'm going to shut up. How are you tonight? I'm wonderful. I'm Good. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. So would that be, was that a fair summary um, of who you close. are? Oh, okay. Very close. Um, a comic book illustrator, New Praetorians is my graphic novel. Right. I'm a creator, illustrator, author. Mm -hmm. um, GM Tips, I hosted GM Tips. Mm -hmm. uh, season two, the first one was with Matthew Mercer, and then he handed me the torch, and I did that one on Geek and Sundry. I'm the former community manager of Dungeons & Dragons, which I'm very, very proud of. That is awesome. Probably one of the, like, the coolest things I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Second would be D&D in a jet, but that's a whole different conversation. Like a jet, <laughs> yeah, I did. like in the air? Yeah, I, we rented a jet for my 38th birthday and played D and D in it <laughs> and, and streamed it. It's on my YouTube channel. That's awesome! Oh my gosh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say I want to confess this. I always research the people that I'm going to have on because I don't want to be a complete buffoon. But I have to say, uh, it was very difficult researching Satine because of the all of the like projects <laughs> she's got going on and, yeah. and all the balls kind of in the air. Um, so, so let's like just sort of start from the beginning. Then let's let's go all the way back. Um, what what were you <laughs> what were you like as a child? We know what you're like now. What were you yes. like as a child? Were you I just was as the same. prolific? <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, I had all the energy in the world, as I still do. Um, I grew up next to libraries, so basically my grandma's house and then this tiny little library in Pollock Pines, Northern California, north of Placerville. And it was really adorable. It's 
probably the, the entire library is probably half the size of this basement. It was wow. so tiny. I, I remember the smell of it. And yeah, that was my playground. So she would read to me all the time and I would play in there. And then when we moved to Sacramento, I that was my hangout was going to libraries. I started reading very, very young. I was reading The Hobbit by eight years old. And um, yeah, that's I was just really into fantasy. I was an artist, so I remember she would help me paint and then she would write stories and I would paint the stories and we make our own little comic books. And yeah, I started playing D&D at eight years old as well in 1988. And I didn't have anyone to play it with, so I just played it with myself. I thought this was the coolest thing. Mm. And I'd read all these different books, you know, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, um, all the way to, you know, kids' books like Indian in the Cupboard. And there was A Castle in the Attic. I really liked that one. It was just, and I was, I wore glasses, so I don't know if you remember a castle in the attic it was up this little boy and he had I, these, i'm a little embarrassed to say windows. i'm an english teacher <laughs> and i don't know castle in the attic what who's the author and do you remember or what was the story about it's like it's like lord of the rings is here and castle in the attic is like way down here it's very very it's like indian in the cupboard except mm -hmm. um the the boy finds a castle in the attic and then he ends up going into the castle and like shrinking down and then that's like his adventure is in this like medieval world so would you used to kind of like like bury yourself in these stories when you oh were yeah a little kid? i would get in trouble so my mom's not a big reader my dad was a poet and a reader and he's very very intelligent but um i would get in trouble for reading and she would knock on the door and like you need to be out here doing something <laughs> i'm like i am busy reading I mean, they even, they put me into, I think it was second grade. They had me in like a fifth grade reading. Oh, wow. That's me. impressive. I, I was just such, I couldn't stop reading. <laughs> yeah. And then my, like I, my mom would yell at me and instead of running away, I would kind of like a never ending story. I would run to the library. That's and great. And you can kind of see your, bunch of books. your yeah. full circle. I mean, look where you are right now. Right? Yeah. I this mean... is one of three libraries in the house. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Are they are they like divided up by genre or topic or just miscellaneous? Yeah, or? actually, these are most. Um, so here's all the gaming books, mm -hmm. and then uh, behind me is just a bunch of like weird shaped books of different things. There's um, not there's fiction right behind me here. A lot of authors that I know, or um, and then over here, and then there's just random fiction here mm -hmm. there's like chuck palinuk and then there's oh. like high fidelity and wow life of pi and they're kind of yep. like all over there and then the bottom because it's the biggest um that's where all of my like art history um that's where my mythology and um books that are like art books mm -hmm. and history books and then upstairs, so Jameson had his own matching library. When I met him, I was like, oh, my God, you have your own library, Perfect. too? Like, our aesthetic was so similar, it was weird. And so um, I brought my books, and then we have another one that's, like, I really like interior design and architecture. Mm -hmm. So there's, like, a whole shelf on that. There's um, four shelves just on digital art and digital painting and um there is a whole shelf on writing a whole shelf on comic book uh writing mm, and cool. illustration um I, let's see there's a whole shelf on travel i i just really love books. what is it about <laughs> is it i mean do you like like do you like the collecting of the books do you like the information contained in the books do you like to transport yeah. yourself with the books like what yeah what is it about them that all of that all of that um i like learning skills and I love, I love mentors and teachers. And the fact that I can have all these shelves of mentors uh, is really important and really amazing. You know, when I made, I've always appreciated books, but when I made my graphic novel, it's like 77 pages. It took me three months and it was absolutely amazing and made me realize how hard it is to make you know, here's an Eberron book. I was looking up Eberron stuff today. Right. Like, 
how hard it is to do the graphic design for the cover, the layout, picking the art, making the art, putting it together so it says exactly what it needs to say. So the typography, I'm, I, have a whole, I have tons. I think I have a whole shelf upstairs just on typography well, and like the emotions that are evoked just by looking. I think that that's a really interesting kind of observation because I think a lot of people will take a book for granted. So of course I, as I'm a reader, I'm an English teacher. I have a book just yes, here too. Obviously, I'm going to show off a book too. I have yeah, book. show off books. Um, what you got there? <laughs> uh, well, I have. Well, this is a rather controversial graphic novel known as Brat Pack, uh, written oh. by Rick Veach back in I want to say the late '80s, early '90s, and it's about superhero sidekicks. It's like ultra violent, and it's supposedly. I, I just picked it up. I've heard stories about it. It's supposed to be on like it's supposed to be up there with like Watchmen and oh Dark very Knight cool returns and things like that but nice if you could send that that'd be great i love watchmen i just i'm i think i even have two copies of watchmen it's yeah uh, it, it's, i would like to introduce you to rpg oh. she also goes by rpg oh. uh, when there's a camera around she can't help herself i love so. it now I, I this would not be an episode of role player with a thousand faces without <laughs> A cameo, or a bark, or a meow, or or something <laughs> from an animal. How old is yeah. RPG? Uh, she is uh, eight years old. Oh, okay. I have Gracie, but Gracie's probably not going to come out. It's very hot, so I'm in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and it's pretty hot here. She is. We we just got here from Alaska, and she's much. She's used to a much like oh my kind of atmosphere. So yeah. she's like, "Where did you bring me? Why am I here?" Why is there pollen in the air, and why are there ticks? Because they're like, aren't ticks? Uh, oh, too poor thing. Yes. No. So, um, well, then tell me. Then uh, I was just sort of like wondering, what is it? Now, that's one thing to kind of like go and read the books and absorb the books and all that. What got you sort of turned around so that then you were creating, like as as a youngster or yeah. whenever you started creating. I have always been creating. So I started with scripting. And mm -hmm. it's funny because I actually do a lot of scripting now. I script my D&D games. I script my comic book. Mm -hmm. um, I would watch movies and I would script them. Wizard of Oz. Uh, there's one called Rockula. It's an MTV movie mm -hmm. about a, a vampire who's a rock star, but he's really bad at it. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, labyrinth and i would just go mm. and i wouldn't just write a script i would write it over and over i'd write the same movie script over and i would do all the dialogue and the actions but i didn't know exactly what a script was yeah i just knew that i needed to log it <laughs> right right well why are you yeah. why were you rewriting it were you making changes on them i was in love or? with it i i just loved it so much i needed to like i memorized by writing yeah and so that was the way I would do it. And I would write down all the lyrics. I would stop and play, stop, play, stop, play, VHS. You know, so I wore out those. Um, yeah, so I was doing that. And then, let's see. It's funny. These are That's a really good question. Uh, I did that. And then I was in art classes, like mm -hmm. junior high all the way into high school. And um, I was just making. I just had to make. Mm -hmm. And I painted. And I have... I actually have all my sketchbooks from like high school and junior mm. high and mm. I just couldn't stop. It was just like it came out and I went through a lot of trauma as a kid and um, a lot of developmental trauma. Mm. And so instead of being able to express myself verbally, I would, um, I would, and I was very verbal, but I couldn't do that with emotion. So I actually like drew all my emotions out. So I got them out in that way. Um, and then realized that I could get a lot of emotions out and say some really crazy things if I could draw them and write them. Right. And then people would look at it and I'd make them a little abstract and be like, just a character. But it's, so, it's, it's interesting the way that you yeah. kind of connect those things for, as far as storytelling goes. Because the way I see it, you know, even something as simple as, or not as simple, but a drawing is a story. And oh, absolutely. a lot of people will sort of think, oh, well, a person's got a lot of skill because maybe that that hand looks really realistic or that that gesture or that that figure looks great but there's not like beyond that there's not just how accurate it may be but there's the accuracy of the story behind it like are you conveying exactly. an emotion or are you conveying like you know a movement or whatever and that is like the the real kind of form of communication 
as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Yeah, for... and people are used to looking at art and glancing and moving on. Look, mm -hmm. glance, move on. And when I realized that, I realized how much power I had as an artist. Um, I could do one of two things. I could be very blatant in what I was communicating, or I could be super subtle about it and kind of embed these stories into an image where people kind of looked at it, but then would think about it later. Like, wait a minute, something right. was off. Like that was, why was she holding her hand like that? Um, I have this funny picture that I painted because I was just being snarky and I was painting. And it's a girl and she's like smelling your finger. I don't know why. Don't know why. No reason. I'm not smelling but... my finger at all. Let you are not. <laughs> it's this really stupid thing that I have. I have a lot of paintings that mean nothing or are just silly and I never show them off. But this one I had up. I've had hundreds of people at my house, you know, going in and out parties and all this. Only my husband was like, he did a double take when we'd first met. And he's like, what is happening here? I'm like, I'm glad you asked. What do you think is happening here? Right. And then his head started going. And I was like, well, I know what I did. I drew and I drew it that way because it's how you interpret the story, like what the story right. you kind of project in. So as an artist and a storyteller, you're only offering like 50 to 75 percent of the story it, the viewer actually participates right. and then embeds that story as well and it's interesting because you're also trying like you mentioned the fact that people just look at something and then they just move on to the next thing but i guess as an artist whether it be writing or drawing or painting or or music or or whatever it happens to be you're actually trying to i mean i'm guessing you're actually trying to grab someone's attention and hold on to it and then manipulate it in a way that follows a certain a, a certain route or, or something. Absolutely. And then yeah. they interpret it in some way that you're hoping that they'll maybe interpret. So that actually makes a lot of sense. So, you know, you asked me, what do, what do, what are you? Who are you? How do you? What is that? Tell team? us. Um, and so, you know, this is something that my husband and I were talking about when we were coming up with the Bard book. You know, like, what is a bard? And Satine is full bard. Like, Satine Phoenix is a bard. I played the trumpet. I was in drama club through high school, drama club president, directed, acted, was in advanced art classes, um, advanced writing, advanced reading. I could not help myself but to create. And so mm. an artist is a master at communication yeah because art is communication it's a the ability to attract with communication or detract and it's the power to manipulate right but not manipulate in a negative way it's just manipulating right. the 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 patterns of which people follow so um, that is that's art art is communication do you and think I'm um, art. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of jumping here I'm jumping the gun a little bit and, and this is also a loaded question because I already have my own opinion formed. Do you think that RPGs are art? Do you think, and I'm not just talking about like the book itself, but like in the same way that maybe a stage play, people go to a stage play on a Friday night or they go to a film. Is that ephemeral moment where you're creating something with other, is that art? I believe it is. Um, so uh, it is, Art, writing is art, directing is art, um, fabricating is art, costume design is art, makeup is art, it's all art. Uh, it, people aren't used to using the word art for all these things. Mm -hmm. And um, when you're storytelling, you are crafting a story, you are writing it, you are an artist, you know? So whether I'm creating so we've got the maze on planet seven which is mm -hmm. a D, D game a, a reality show and a uh D, D game reality show and a game show all in one that's it's its own art form right right uh you've got a D, &D live streams that is art in its own way it's two people talking but if a thing can evoke emotion it is art mm. If in your D&D game you're afraid, if you're happy, if you're, you know, um, angry, it's all evocative. And that if you and 
it's I've thought about this a long time mm -hmm. about like what art is and what communication is and what emo how it r relates to emotion. Mm -hmm. I should probably draw a diagram at some point, an infographic. Oh, I think I was imagining what you just drew right now, and it was perfect. Whatever it awesome. was, it was absolutely perfect. <laughs> I totally got what you were doing. Yeah. So um, I yeah I I just want to say I agree. And you, you win, you get to go on to the next level of questioning. Thank yes. you Yes. <laughs> I need to like make some little ding, ding, ding sound effects ding, and ding, some ding. buzzes. And <laughs> so then what is it? So at a certain point, you s sort of decided to go, to go pro as far as like being, because I mean, if, if there's a professional out there, you're certainly a professional role player there wasn't until now so <laughs> there we go i know well it's such a weird thing right because it's mm -hmm. it's a relatively recent development uh you know in the history of of the world that role yeah. playing has sort of come onto the scene and all those things that you're talking about like actual plays uh the friday night game um you know streaming all that stuff is relatively uh, in its infancy right so um mm -hmm. when was it that you sort of ventured did you just sort of venture onto the internet or did you did somebody say hey let's go what, what happened how did this happen so um you know i i've been playing by myself when i was a kid and then in high school i found a group of people who played and i said i'm playing with you and then through college art school san francisco academy of art of course oh cool plays D &D, mm -hmm. at least half of them and then, yeah, I went to Academy of Art for five years, 3D animation, 2D animation, stop motion animation, sculpture and illustration. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Um, and then I dropped out because I was like, all I need is a portfolio. I've got a yeah. great portfolio. I need life experience. And so I went off and did that. I took a break off of D&D. And did a lot of wild things all over. You know, I was like, I'm in my 20s. I'm going to do yeah. 20s things. I'm only going to look like that for this amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I already knew that I was going to be a comic book artist and a writer and director. So um, it was easy for me to do that. And when I got out of it, um, I had met someone. We moved to Australia and did a whole lot of wild, uh, you know, adventuring there, backpacking mm -hmm. and um, events. And we didn't have any friends. I was a fitness model as well, so I didn't drink. We loved dancing, but we didn't want to meet people in that world. So we decided to go to meetup.com and hmm. look up D&D. &D. And we found people in Sydney, Australia. They were adults. That was a big thing. They had to be adults. Right. They wanted to play like an intellectual game. Right. Right. Uh, puzzles and social and all that. And we met people and they, we it all went down to murder hoboing and it was hilarious. And we're like, oh, we can do this. And then I, I moved. We it was consensual him. murder hoboing. It was consensual murder hoboing. I, it just defaulted to it, but we all wanted. We actually had this whole thread going, no, 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 we're here for an adult game of Dungeons and Dragons. Right. And it was just like murder, murder, murder. Um, I moved back and a lot of my friends. Um, we're in the adult industry and mm -hmm. they were like, I was like, look, my girlfriend has fibromyalgia and endometriosis. She can't move. She's an artist and a gamer. Couldn't even play video games. Her mm -hmm. knuckles were so swollen and in pain. And I was like, well, there's this thing called Dungeons and Dragons. So as long as you can kind of just be in one place, right. maybe this is something you can do. And of course, my friends are all entrepreneurs. So they're like, Let's do a show about it. Yeah. So there's a show called I Hit It With My Axe that we made in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's around anymore. Um, a couple things happened with those folks and I don't associate with um, some of mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we had a web series on The Escapist. Mm -hmm. We were interviewed for IO9 and Maxim and it was wild. Porn you were interviewed models. in French news. That's that's where I heard about <laughs> like I couldn't find anything in English about that show. I found the the it oh, mentioned that's in, so in, funny. in France. And I was just like, What? Was this some obscure <laughs> thing you only did in France? And then no, but I so don't know. Funny. Just a yeah. coincidence. Um yeah, I think I even took it I had it hosted on my YouTube, but I took it down. It was mm -hmm. just there's too much too much drama and right. I, I don't like to be involved with that i like to be very creative and positive so mm -hmm. um yeah and then when i stopped doing that in like 2009 2010 
uh, Meltdown Comics in Hollywood yes. said, hey, come and run our D&D games. And I was like, who even are you? <laughs> what? And, oh, my God, yeah, ladies and no gentlemen. Idea. you know, If you are not in Los Angeles, <laughs> if you are not in Los Angeles, you can be forgiven. Yeah, uh, no, however, I, had, I didn't know. Meltdown is huge, was huge. It exactly. is huge. Exactly. Well, it was funny. It was a part of this group, and it was – professionals in LA who got together on Sundays mm -hmm. and it was called comic book Sunday. And so we'd all get together. These are like directors, producers, um, sound guys, like, like all these yeah. people. I mean, I think underworld was started by two people who met at, at um, comic book Sunday mm -hmm. and we'd all be nerds, bring our comics to share right. and trade. And if right. we made comics. And so, um, I guess I just kind of they got around that I was doing this D and D thing, and it took like a year for me to be like, okay, I guess I'll do this thing over at Meltdown. And um, there, these twins, these actor twins, I think they're Disney twins or something, were running that, and they were like, well, why don't you do it? And because they were going to college, and then I did, and it was the most amazing thing. It was um, suddenly, you know, it. They only had a, a few people going to it, but because I've been organizing events my whole life, I was right. able to organize like two days a week where it was all Dungeons and Dragons. I did a couple days a week as well. That was all like life drawing. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it just turned into this thing. It went from like one table to six to yeah. eight tables. And then on Sundays, I'd make pancake breakfast and bacon. And Wait, we'd, for, your, really, for really your, the fun. people that were coming in? Yeah, it was wow. just like this fun family. I that went we to had. art school, and no teacher of mine ever made me pancake breakfast. <laughs> um, yeah, I you know I was with um I was with a youth group from the Freemasons uh, when I was a kid, so we just did a lot of pancake breakfast. Right, lots of pancake breakfast. So I was like, this is really fun. And I was like, what are the other things that I love? I love uh, being on camera. I love running Dungeons and Dragons. I love charity. So I started a thing called Celebrity Charity 20 mm -hmm. in 2010. And I had been friends with Keith Baker for a couple years. And we always wanted to work together. And Keith Baker made Eberron. I don't, I didn't put places here, but if you haven't checked out Eberron, there you we go. probably, uh, it's amazing. And um, yeah, I was like, well, why don't we do this event together? Well, he writes it, he writes the adventure and we have four people dungeon mastering and i was like okay well the people that we're going to have gaming they're going to be celebrities uh maybe you know d-list celebrities be a i'm not sure whoever we can get a hold of and their fans and friends and family will donate to this charity and the mm -hmm. charity is called reach out and read it's a childhood literacy foundation that provides pediatricians with the um with a program to teach parents the importance of reading to kids from three months old to 18 years old, that sends them home with books. It's like my favorite charity in the world. Mm. So impressive. And um, back then there were only web series. So this is 2010. This mm -hmm. is pre Twitch. This is right. pre live streaming. Right. Um, before Twitch, it was just in TV, which also came out of meltdown. Uh, it was on the side building. And then Nerdist, I think, was still doing podcasts back mm -hmm. then. So this is 2010, mm -hmm. very long time ago. And so I was like, okay, guys, I got an idea. Check this out. We're going to put everybody on, on camera. We're going to record audio, and we're going to film it live. We're yeah. going to broadcast it live. And everyone was like, you're a lunatic, Zach. You're you? insane. That's crazy. No one will yeah. ever do no that. No one's going to like that. Ooh. Who's going to do it? So... Um, the first year, 2010, it was a horrible mess. It, I put four cameras on the same website. So you go to the website and it's just like this cacophony of, of awful. Um, but we had like Matt Mercer was there. Uh, he played, Marisha was playing, Taliesin. Uh, Jason Charles Miller was at a table. Uh, yeah, we, they, and obviously now they do yeah, yeah. I've streamed professionally. You may have and heard of some of them. And then the next year, you may have heard of some of them. Um, and then the next year, it was um, the same, but I spaced it different. And I think I put them on different web pages, but on the same site. Right. And that still you're, wasn't you're right. Learning. Learning. The third year is when it clicked. This is 2013. Mm -hmm. 
I started doing it in a format of everyone's around the same table. So you got one camera and you got uh, the dungeon master and then you got the people next to them. And then I was like, okay, four tables back to back, three hours each. They all run the same game. You get to see how different dungeon masters run right. the game. Right. You get to see how the players make different choices and do have different outcomes. And to this day, everyone's still using the same format, format. that we had back then. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty amazing. Uh, you know, at that same time, Geek and Sundry uh, did their thing. Yep. And then Critical Role was like, that's yep. cool. Let's do that over on Geek and Sundry. And then a Twitch came out and was yeah. like, boom, now yeah. everyone has access to do this. Made my life easier. Um, let me ask you <laughs> then, here's the thing. You just sort of jump in, right? And and you're at the early stages of this. And so I think it's prob you're probably a good person to ask this question of. What's the difference? What makes a, because here's the thing. It, right now it's the Wild West. There's no uh, Game Master, Dungeon Master certification. There's no, nothing like that. Um, anyone can call themselves a pro, like Dungeon Master, Game Master. What's the difference between... And nothing wrong with it, like the at-home standard DM, GM, and a pro. Mm -hmm. Like to you, what do, what do you think you did besides obviously broadcasting it? Yeah. It's, it's not a matter of just, I don't believe that it's just a matter of aiming a camera. There's something you're also, there's got to be something you're doing behind you're the scenes that right. people don't mm -hmm. see that does somehow come across. What are you doing that's professional? Yeah, so there's two things. There's like I some people get paid for dungeon mastering. I know that there's websites like Demiplane where you can like you can dungeon master for forty dollars a person, and it's really cool. So Demiplane.com. But I make a living off of it. I yeah, I feel like I make a really good living off of it. I run multiple games on Patreon a week. I am a, a coach, storytelling coach, dungeon master coach. For my live events, um, I, as you heard, Satine's Quest, I'm actually training mm -hmm. dungeon masters. So there will be a Satineification <laughs> instead of a certification. There we go. But um, there's a couple different things. You know, when you're around a table, there's this casualness to it where you're on an adventure with your friends and it kind of can go on and on. But when you're a professional dungeon master, you are scripting out a thing and you're not necessarily taking people on a railroad. Right. But you're, you're basically developing a virtual reality game or a video game for them, for their minds. So you give them a choose your own adventure and, they, and you walk them through that choose your own adventure. It is railed because you know, you, the game master, are, and your art, your art is guiding people through right. story. And so you know that here's the bad guy. This is what they need, they want to do. This yeah. is what they're willing to do to get there. Yeah. And so your adventurers are like, we have to go defeat that thing. These are the this is the path to take in order to defeat this person. And within that, there's different trees where you can go this way, this way, or this way. But they all lead back to this person who's in one place, right? So um, knowing that that is something that's really important that separates professional dungeon masters from at-home dungeon masters sometimes i think people that play at-home games like like ongoing campaigns mm -hmm. might have more fun because they don't have to keep time they're right. also not doing it for other people when i'm at home and i'm playing with my friends you know we're eating we're yeah. laughing we're doing all this stuff but when you're on camera you're not only developing a game to a game for your players, but you're also developing it so it's interesting to them and outwards to yes. the audience. So a couple different things, like I'm a director as well. I did a lot of directing in high school and then, you know, little things here and there. But I as a dungeon master, professional dungeon master, you're a director. So you have your cast, you have your actors. They all know not to eat on camera. They know that they need to be very quick. There's a certain professional etiquette, like live streaming etiquette. Yeah. And this is something that I, I don't see a lot in other people's games, but right. um, I try to train my players right. to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you see me looking down at chat. We're in an interview, we're very casual here. But like no chat, they they're not allowed to look at chat. They're not allowed to interact with chat. You saw Jameson and I interact. We love our couples. Yeah, D &D but that's the format of the show. Exactly. 
Um, but generally, it's like you disengage from that. You're creating a Netflix show for yeah. people to enjoy. So with that said, um, you, the game master, are a screenwriter. Yeah. You are developing a story, understanding that you only have X amount of time to have your episode. And like a screenwriter, you have to n navigate the different scenes that are interesting. So if I'm doing a game for a group of people at a convention, I do a lot of conventions, I, I can make a game that's like, ah, here's three bullet points and we're going to have a really fun time. But if I'm doing something for a live stream, I know the path that needs to happen in order to raise emotion and lower emotion and push and pull. And so maybe one episode is gonna have a lot of combat, one's gonna have a lot of social, a lot of kind of character development. But over the season, I need to navigate and manipulate all these different highs and lows to make sense so that it all comes together and is an actual story so that when people like me binge a thing, yeah. It's really interesting. So as you noticed, games like Critical Role will go on for like three, four hours, right? But other games, especially since nobody, you know, not a lot of people are getting paid for their live streams. And if they are, it's very little amount of money. Um, those games are usually two to three hours max. Yes. Because A, it's a long time to ask people to watch. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm trying to navigate going down even more. So that's what Couples D&D &D is, is one hour long. And half of that is just us talking about our lives and being very yeah. casual. But, you know, how do you... Uh, well, anyways, that's just what I'm... No, I... Because I'm always trying to innovate and make... I, um, I think what you're saying is really interesting because yeah. I face sort of the same thing. So I don't know if you've heard of me. I have a little channel too. Just a few other viewers. Oh, you, yeah. what, you're on it. Here we are. <laughs> but anyway, I, well, to me, because one thing that I, you know, caught uh, my attention about you was, of course, uh, and it's interesting that you're, you're bringing it up, was um, essentially you, you wrote the, the heroines, the action heroines, journey, yes. right? Which I was like, ding, 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 ding. For me, that's just like, oh, good. Someone's got something new to say about like the hero's journey let's see what this angle is going to be so i think a lot about it as a teacher and as a game master because if i'm lecturing to students in a classroom i have to think about the age range i have to think about the format mm -hmm. i have to think about who's yes. there uh yes. whether or not this is something that's compulsory or whether they're there to have a fun time um so i'm looking at highs and lows throughout mm -hmm. and and to me, what's interesting about what you've done here is um, it sounds to me like you're riding human emotions and doing your best, again, in that, art, that thing that you were saying artists do. You're riding emotions and maybe manipulating them in a way that's a good way uh, to carry them through the story. Like a movie yeah. is just a, a movie is railroading. You're just staring at something. But you as the game master or dungeon master have to know, okay, who's reacting what way and now how do we get seven different people to all sort of reach the same point where they jump over this hurdle they all feel exhausted and then we have a quiet yes. scene or something afterward yeah but, but that's a that's a lot is there a satine phoenix approach to to like doing this yeah acting so um as an actor you and, and so there's two things there's acting and um storytelling but understanding like how to write stories mm -hmm. and write scenes for visual storytelling um so there's a book and i tell i talk about this a lot i think every game master needs to read it it's called story by robert mckee yes and it, oh it's so beautiful mm -hmm. and my and i go over the dialogue scene over and over and i got it on audiobook so i just like listen to it a lot but i when you're an actor you put yourself in so if you ever see me you know role play i'm, I'm basically just yeah. acting i'm embodying that character and so i'm like i'm in it and i'm am with everything in the world and i'm with everyone in the world and the environment and so i'm really feeling my way through um with my mind right um, but in story they talk about dialogue or like they talk about scenes and everyone enters a scene with a need 
Your yeah. bad guy enters a scene with a need. You enter a scene with a need. And the fun part is the conflict. You want this. They want this. You got to fight over it. Or, you know, and it can be as easy as you both walk into a room and want that glass of water. Right. You know, you're both thirsty. Right. And so you have a need. When you think about it that way and you write your storytelling, you write your game with that in mind, um, it, you, like, there's something, sometimes when I'm dungeon mastering the sirens where I just write scenes back to back where they need something and the other person needs something else and I just let them role play. Right. And it's like, and it's it's amazing. I, I don't know exactly what they're going to do, but I know that if the world has needs, the world interjects itself or uh, comes across the players, then you've got really interesting things. So in order to evoke those emotions, the things in the world have to have a certain series of needs. Right. Um, and I think so that, yeah. Well, I was going to say, and I think what what's important about having that need and maybe uh, is that the need has to be fulfilled by the end of the scene. And then you get that sense of satisfaction like that, that is built artificially into a movie or, or a scripted work. And then satisfaction or want or a desire, right? Or, right. Yeah. Something <laughs> gets, something gets like kind of like f uh, finished and yet there's still a little opening for the next thing that's going to carry you in. And then you kind of end that. And I think what I see when I, I don't want to say I see mistakes from game masters, but I'll, I'll just say in some games that I sometimes play, I feel like sometimes the, GM doesn't know exactly when to end it and if they don't know when to end that scene maybe it comes from them not knowing how what what the the want or the need was for the scene in the in the first place exactly so I actually when I you know the things that I'm doing for live streaming I'm actually doing for live games or like in-person mm -hmm. games now and it's helped so much one of them is timing i actually have a time a breakdown of everything oh no kidding it's really helped with the maze on planet seven because my my scenes are only five minutes 10 minutes 15 and 20 minutes that's really so fast for like i have a... to like go in and then pull out and then i'm retraining the actors two of them have played DD for a very long time two are new and so i'm having to retrain the actors who who are used to just kind of going on and on having this right. continuous thing and I, I give them a heads up. I'm like, scene one is going to be five minutes. And they're like, what is right. it about? And so I, as a game master, when I'm narrating them the like exposition to, to kind of hand off the role play to them, I have to kind of establish what the scene's need is. Mm -hmm. And so I am now breaking it down, clarifying information, being more efficient, because in five minutes, I shouldn't be talking very much. Right. I need to get my point across like that. Screenwriting is great because it teaches you that efficiency, yes. that word efficiency. Yeah. And so I writing it. It's interesting writing, that you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, writing a comic book is a really good way to explore that because you know that the there's dialogue, and then there's the script mm. description, and then all the other stuff the visual stuff that doesn't need that uh that scripting you the game master can set up all that visual element that would be in a comic book you set that up through that five minute scene yeah. so you're giving them more information over time as they're interacting with the world yeah and i think what you you kind of hit on something really important there you said something very simple that i think a lot of people have a hard time understanding and that's like you're not the one that's doing all the talking. And I think it's important to, in teaching, we say you want to elicit from the students. You don't want to stand up there and necessarily lecture. What you want to do is set something up and then like walk away quietly. And that little, that little verbal thing is like a bomb. And there's this yeah. instant communication among players or students or, or whatever, and they all sort of work through it. And I think a lot of game masters sometimes when they're, I don't want to be negative, but I think sometimes they confuse the idea of, you know, narrating something to someone with setting situations up that enable the players to sort of explode into conflict or uh, dis debate and discussion over something or whatever yeah. it happens to be. Um, do you do you miss? Or let me ask you this: Do you still play like <laughs> private games on the side? Um, no, I don't have time anymore. Do you miss that? How does it, that's what I kind of figured. I talked to a lot of people mm. and they said, 
how do you do you like i mean the closest would be the closest would be like the D and D in a castle, the Satines quest, the mm -hmm. Gen Con games, and so it's not that I'm not DMing that. And also because I live stream, I love the respect and efficiency of the players that live stream. Mm -hmm. There is no like people aren't stopping to look stuff up. They trust. There's trust. It's that like fast right. movement. There's this. We're doing. I made a decision. We're going right. ahead with it. This is how it's going. I love the way live streamers play because of that. Now, it's funny because I have been missing a home game. I haven't played with the Sirens in over a year until uh -huh. we did this last Kickstarter. Yeah. We did six, uh, five episodes, five and a half, because the last one was more character. Kind of, I had the characters just explore each other and kind yeah. of talk about their pasts. And then we had a meeting a couple days ago where like, look, I want to do an ongoing campaign. But I love my siren. So uh, we're going to start an ongoing campaign and have it on stream and podcast in November. And then we can just do it. And we go and just like a normal game, people will come in and out of it. You know, there'll be a story, but, you know, you'll have like three main characters for every little arc. I'm really excited to do that. That's uh, great. I mean, I what love was... live streaming. <laughs> Well, I can I can kind of see the appeal of it. I mean, there's a certain electricity to to the room. There's like an energy to it, and um, I I have to admit from myself, like I I probably wouldn't be a teacher if I didn't like being up in front of a bunch of people yeah. and, and running things. And I take a certain and I assume you too take a certain sense of like a bit of pride in being able to drop that bomb and then step back and have the students or the players come out on the other side and say, yes. wow, what's going to happen next time or whatever. Um, yeah, exactly. How, how's, um, so you mentioned sirens and you're, you're trying to get into this, this bigger thing. So, so congratulations again on, on that. What was, was that your first, that's your first Kickstarter, right? That's your only Kickstarter? Like, were you doing? So that was my first Kickstarter that I was like, you know. The uh, main. Yeah, the main. Force. I mean, so my husband did a Warlock book last year. We actually met on his Kickstarter. And then you met? In January, yeah. <laughs> Wait, that's got to be nerdier than the nerdiest thing I've ever heard. Like, like forget about meeting on Tinder Forget about like meeting like on I, yeah. you met on a Kickstarter, on ladies his, and gentlemen. His TTRPG Warlock Kickstarter. So if if you're the new Match dot no not Match dot com the new Tinder, <laughs> yeah, okay. just do a Kickstarter. If it doesn't work <laughs> out, maybe you can find your true love. That's a, yeah. It were was, you guys it like was talking? love at first sight? No, it's funny because I came in. I was doing childhood trauma therapy all summer. And okay. my friends were like, we really want you to be on this. You're really going to like it. And I was like, I can't. I can't do it. I I need to do this for myself. Yeah, it's part of yeah. my hero's journey. I need to do this. And the last day, so I finally said yes. And I had not done any streaming. This is quarantine time. I'm like, yeah. when else am I going to get six months to recover from my life, right? right. Um, so I was like, okay. And I'd did my last big bout of crying and, and therapy. And then I slapped a bunch of makeup on, put a wig on. And I told them, I'm like, look, they want me there for four hours. I can't do that. I can do two hours. And so I get it out. I get up like, okay, I sign in and they had gone on break and all my friends show up and I'm like, Oh, it's so nice to see my friends. What was I thinking? Of course I'm going to love doing this. I right. love my friends. And then the box was empty, and they're like, oh, well, this guy, uh, this is his Kickstarter. This um, guy. This yeah. guy. I was like, what's his name? And I was like, um, Domadridge. It says Domadridge on the bottom. My friends did not tell me about this guy. They just told me about this book. And so uh, I get there, and he sits down. He was grabbing a glass of water. He was late, and I was like, okay. He gets on, and I was like. Strike one. And it, it was like what was that wayne's world dream weaver and i was just like That's love awesome. at first sight That's i was so like are funny. you kidding me i never get this way i am so professional right in the last 10 years i've always been extremely professional in my interactions with everyone and then all of a sudden he didn't say a word and he was 
he was just so quiet and i'm like oh is he like the strong quiet type like what's going on uh and then we had a scene together where he uh he like lassoed me with this tentacle whip and i said i consented and he was like oh my god she said the c word that's, that's a nice. big that's a big yeah. uh thing tentacles yeah. uh lassoing tentacles. Yeah. role playing my goodness it was very exciting it was very exciting and then uh then i looked him up and he had a daughter and i was like oh my god it was very exciting and then i looked him up he had a daughter and there was pictures of him and this girl and i was like oh no 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 that's I'm, right i am fully resp I, do, yeah. I do not i'm not a homewrecker i do not get involved with people like that and then i threw up on so it was like a week later he missed the live play with us like the entire cast was there on my chat but he was in the twitch restream and yeah. i was like i wish everyone was here but he didn't see it so like oh a week or two that's go by. so i know that's so like it just reminds me like my heart <laughs> just went back to like high school <laughs> And like and like hoping some like girl yeah. sees something I wrote and oh like says God, something exactly, or whatever. That's so funny that you that's say exactly, that. That's like, exactly. And I had flashback. not felt that. I had not felt anything right. like that before. I mean, not since high school. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I posted. I've been, I post my trauma a lot, like my therapy mm -hmm. and everything and what I go through. And I put these books up. And he replied with. Oh, if you like those, this is what my therapist. This is what I've studied. I'm a, you know, a triple major, triple psychology major, and in, oh. in these fields. And I was like, that's literally what I'm studying because I'm writing a book on how D and D has helped me through trauma and PTSD. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I so that's something that I'm doing. So we started messaging, and he dropped the single dad, and I was like, oh, that's there it. we and go. We, yeah, and then we've been you know. together ever since. Yeah. So that's anyhow. our that's our love story. That's that's amazing. <laughs> I don't even think we can continue with the interview now. We just have to end <laughs> it on that. But I kind of want to get into one thing you mentioned there, and that yeah. that was you're talking about how how D and D affects your life. And so I read an article, and I I like to give credit where credits due. I don't even know this person, but uh, Goldie Cham in Forbes, yes, Goldie. Forbes, I ladies and gentlemen, role players are being interviewed in Forbes. Do you understand? The gravity of that. This is um, magical. You you mentioned that uh, you think that you know you can help people attain mm -hmm. their next level, and to me that kind of ties in with like the like the hero's journey and the, and RPGs and all that stuff. How can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by that? Yeah. Oh wow, this is so beautiful, and it's really perfect because you know when I was studying uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And then I was I wrote Action Heroine's Journey based mm -hmm. off of the female's hierarchy of needs. And I studied that. And then I was realizing that, like, why am I so attracted to Dungeons and Dragons? What is it that makes me so passionate? And it's a developmental thing. And yeah. it's like it fulfilled all these needs. Right. So here I am, eight years old. It's going to get real dark. And I'll bring it right back up. Um, I was uh, molested for nine years by my father, uh, who was also like an amazing dad, but also a very troubled individual. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I couldn't defeat him in real life, mm -hmm. but I was able to create these monsters and a character who could defeat him. So it was really wild where I've seen a lot of troubled kids who have been in these abusive situations not be able to come out the other side you know, suicide yeah. and all these um all these these things but dungeons and dragons gave me that lifeline yeah. and so here i am exploring my sexuality exploring myself as a kid as a teenager um realizing and i was in taekwondo i was a uh, commissioner of clubs i was an avid reader and i realized that i could be this character and of course, I'm an actress, so it was like, oh, and I could draw it, and I could, I could make the costumes. I was doing all the things. Like, oh, I could literally be this character. If this character can level up by going to the gym, uh, then right. I can get stronger. If this character can be faster because of the martial arts, then mm -hmm. I could take martial arts, and I could do that, raise my charisma, mm -hmm. learn how to do makeup and hair. And so over time, I started doing all these things. And, you know, as a, an attractive young woman, 
it is hard. <laughs> it is mm -hmm. very hard. So um, I got to explore all these different um, ways to utilize these skills and how to build more skills and understanding like the more skills I develop, the more valuable I can be in other ways than just being, and this is something we teach Freya, our daughter, mm -hmm. is she's four years old and we're like, what's better than being pretty? she that's what she sees everywhere princesses yeah. princesses right. and right. i'm always in makeup i'm not today but right. you got sateen in the raw and we're like, what's that's what we that? want that's what we deliver here yeah. at Roleplay. Yeah. other other shows give you like all uh. the, the fakey fake <laughs> this is the real thing yeah this is the real deal um so we tell her you know what's more important than being pretty and she goes being strong and being smart and being kind and i was like yes you, you know so she's already like level up here right um you know level six four years old it's fantastic it's it's but, interesting oh go ahead uh that's what no please i love this conversation well i was just gonna say one thing i don't know if you know this or not but this is something i've always looked i look into a lot just because i'm a teacher and i believe in role playing the experiences that you have in your mind um like when you're reading a book when you're telling a story uh, the same like little synapses and all that are firing that would be firing were you actually doing those things assuming you're engaged. So mm -hmm. the idea of role playing and becoming like the the the, the young uh, girl that can like slay the dragon or whatever, you're practicing in your head, you're modeling it for yourself and it becomes yeah. something that you can take with you into real life. So what often happens with children is that um, and I'm not, I'm not obviously not a doctor, but I'm an English teacher that's been around kids for 20 years. And what I've seen anecdotally is that a lot of kids are rehearsing. Yes. And, and they're rehearsing themselves as someone who's uh, victorious or someone mm -hmm. who conquers something or someone who is a kind person or somebody that just likes themselves and is happy with who they are. It's so, practicing, yeah. Yes, you're practicing to be your better you or to be, you know, to, to improve you. Um, so it doesn't sort of surprise me at all that someone would find that sort of, you know, value in role playing, you know. Um, so I think yeah. it's like a great, a great observation that, that you've made there with that. Um, yeah, so it was really cool, like learning, like doing all, like learning about myself but then the difference is, is usually you feel alone and you're like having all this trauma, you know, yeah. happen. And so all of a sudden I was out there and I was with friends role playing. And so it's not that I was I was I wasn't stuck in my own head. Mm -hmm. I was caring about all the other people in my team and we were working together. So that in itself is very valuable. And when I was studying PTSD trauma therapy, a lot of the things that they talk about is like recreating a, first being a part of a group that does yeah. something good right yeah. so stage plays or fundraisers being a part of something being able to have something to show for all of your hard work mm. and then re uh by doing things like this you're creating new positive memories that almost mm -hmm. overwrite yes uh, these negative memories yes and so now you you're like with dungeons and dragons in a two hour span, you can have six months of memories. Yeah. And um, looking into that, I've been able to develop session zeros that we're actually putting into um, the thebardbook.com, right. Science Battle of the Bards, right. where you can develop a three year history in 10 minutes. Um, it is fabulous and wonderful. And so in my trauma therapy, I realized that. And so it goes from, you know, Finding yourself as a hero yeah. to branching out and adventuring with other heroes with a dungeon master whose understanding of the situation, allowing people to explore in a very safe manner. And then at the end of that, being the dungeon master who is there and facilitating that for other people. Mm. So that is essentially the very long and short of uh, what my PTSD D&D book is about. I, I think that's great because I really think that in, I, I think that one of the, sort of things that people overlook about being a game master or dungeon master is the fact that you need to, a lot of people think, oh, you have to read the rules, you have to know how it works. It's more to me about social skills and understanding of other human beings, how to read them 
and then not, I, I keep saying the word, I have to think of a better word, but how to manipulate how they're, how they're working through something in a way that is, you know, fruitful for like production of a story or uh, these inner feelings of satisfaction or, or sometimes of sadness or whatever yeah. it is. And you're working through those sorts of things. Um, so I think the idea of a, I think that's something that could be extremely valuable, like a book like that, given, you know, to the right people and given with the right GM and DM. And I think that's kind of key because to me, I see a lot of people that I, I have a personal opinion about what you can cover, like in a game. And my opinion might be controversial, but I, as far as I'm concerned, consenting adults at a table, two, three, four, five can cover anything they want the same way that you can choose to go out and watch any movie that you want. And you can sort of, I think the key is the behavior between the players and the respect and the forgiveness when uh, there's a mistake. Boundaries, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. boundaries are really important. And I'm, I love that I've seen more people have boundaries at the game table, which spreads to a lot of the codependent behaviors that my generation, the Gen X generation has. Oh, Gen X, I don't know, and then I'm kind of in that weird over two millennials, but even they have a lot more better boundaries than millennials mm -hmm. and um, Gen Zs. But um, yeah, the Gen, us Gen X, it's so awkward watching the different um, generations play with each other. The younger generations are oh, teaching the older generations, you can say no, you can say no thank you, you can um, say, it uh, makes me uncomfortable, but I don't want to stop. Can we pause? Right. You know, there's all this new etiquette that's happening at the game table because people are learning how to so interact socially. You don't have to sit there when somebody's being vulgar. You can say, I, I don't like this. Right. But that doesn't mean that I don't like you. Right. That just means I've consented to be here. That is behavior that makes me uncomfortable. I would like to still be here. I would like you to still be here. I don't hate you. Right. You know, there's a lot of weird, um, not weird, but there's a lot of behaviors that people have, especially grognard gamers, that um, there's, when you're diving into somebody's head, into their psyche, they are so vulnerable. And so I find that a lot of people who are, not used to being vulnerable, that are in these vulnerable situations, they have a lot of intense reactions to them. You get people table flipping, you get people being aggressive and verbally abusive to one another. But um, now I'm watching and I'm so grateful. People are starting to understand, learn how to create boundaries for themselves and stand up for their friends when they know their friends aren't able to speak up. Yeah, I, I think that that's actually you, you hit a lot of like um, like really great kind of kind of points there that I, I can't really add to. But I, I completely agree with what you, you just said. Um, and this kind of leads me to uh, another idea here. And that is in a role playing game, like one thing that always impresses me about just people in general is sometimes I look around the table and I'm like, I can't believe that 55-year-old guy is pretending to be like a, a, like a <laughs> dwarf right now with a silly voice and he has to go back tomorrow and go back to like his stockbroker job. This is just the yeah. most bizarre thing in the world. How, how is it that you think um, role-playing can maybe help people? You had mentioned in another article with Philippe Berry in 20, on 20 Minutes. The, it's a French uh, uh, news uh, uh, site. Um, you had mentioned to him that you thought that RPGs can maybe help people come out. And I think that's a really interesting term, come out as just being a player. But the idea of coming out in general, it doesn't have to be restricted to just somebody like professing exactly. like a different yeah. sort of, you know, sexuality or whatever. It could be anything. It could be coming out as like, I love to collect erasers and I've been embarrassed about it my entire life. But yeah. now I can find it. How do you think that role, uh, like role playing can help people come out as themselves. It's um, talking practice equals confidence, right? The more you do a thing, the more confident you are. And a lot of people feel shame for the things that they like because bullies, because parents, because siblings or whatever yeah. it is that makes them feel shame for the things that they like. Maybe an ex-girlfriend once and only once said, that's stupid. 
that can affect somebody their whole lives. And so by being by being around people who accept you as you are mm -hmm. in all of your fun and stupid and silly ideas, you create the you, you build this confidence of like, wait a minute, I'm having so much fun. It doesn't matter what other people think of me. And right. that right there should be something they teach in high school and junior high and elementary school. And I think that's what we're trying to teach our daughter is like, be yourself. People are going to like you for who you are because you are true and real and honest. Mm. Um, also, you know, I, it's so funny. I noticed that, and this is just playing with thousands of people over the last 10, 11 years. People have a thing, have a like when they're young. You know, usually they play a certain way when they're like five to eight years old. And then in high school, maybe they do a little bit of it, but then, you know, college in their 20s and 30s or usually just their 20s they they kind of let it all like fall to the wayside but then right. 30s see they run out of time or yes. energy and they really just want to do the things that they wanted to do when they were five <laughs> yeah you know and then they do and it's amazing and it's the people that do that they stay young there's that neuroelasticity mm -hmm. that um it's, they practice, they're using their imaginations, they don't stagnate, they have something yeah. to live for, they have something to strive for. There's always more stories to tell and, and it's really beautiful to see a lot of adults wake up. Right. That's probably the coolest thing and that's one of the things that's important for me as a game master for the masses is to show people that they n should never stop creating and they should never stop playing. What do you think it is about you because to me, my impression of you is that you're very frank and forthright and, and open about yourself and your past. And you also bring it, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, and, you know, because I don't know exactly, but when I see your games or whatever, you're bringing your passion or your feelings to them. What is it about you that enables you to have done this and, um, and be so open about this that might be different to than someone that's like... Uh, a little more reserved and 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 if that reserved person asks you like well what can i do to be a little bit more open like what would you say to them so how are you this oh. how are you so open oh what, my what made you so <clears throat> yeah what was it because because like to me it feels like <laughs> people work through their lives in order to become more open like we have in my opinion there's a lot like the u.s is kind of a rather sort of closed relatively society mm -hmm. where people aren't we say that we're open but we're not exactly open there's tons of stuff we still don't talk about but you yeah. seem open from like the get-go yeah and i assume obviously like everybody you've gone through your own journey and there are things that have changed but what what's given you this kind of ability um a couple of different things perspective when i was a kid when i was i remember being like seven between six and eight i would like Kind of imagine myself in the future and old and i would go back in time and, and play with space and like my grandmother i would always ask her like why are you just hanging out with me all the time and she's like well i, I really want to be a writer i wanted to travel i want to do all these things she was in her 60s she died at 64 cancer everywhere you know was a lifetime smoker um and she had all these dreams and she never attained any of them not one she ended up being a nurse for a long time and then raising kids and i and she kind of like drilled this into me and i watched her do crossword puzzles she was so talented with words and i was like and then she died when i was like 12 and i've got this ring on my finger this is 1949 it's her high school mm -hmm. ring and i remember when i was little going i'd never want to be like that and i don't know what if we lived one life or, you know, we're resurrected or whatever, you know, we come back in another form. I don't know what those things are, but I do know that right now, this life is the only one I have. And I remember my dad didn't want me dyeing my hair and my mom, right. she didn't want me doing something. And I remember I was like, here are these people that I looked up to, they're terrible people. They're very, they're horrible people. Why do I care so much? And every time that I follow my own intuition yeah it works and every like 
quarantine. I wore bathing suits the whole time. Like I, I'm outside in Los Angeles, just wearing bathing suits. Like I feel good. It's hot, and I. And I remember some people looking at me like, oh, my goodness. And I was like, does it matter what they think? Yeah. No, it doesn't. I'm not hurting anyone. Yeah. I'm not um, vulgar. Yeah. I do things. I, I know that I'm a good person. I am living the life that I want to live. And that is better to do that than not be myself. And so I know I live very 80 years, 100 years, a very short amount of time in the grand scheme of things. And if I am not true to myself, I will be wasting time and I do not want to waste any time. I got in a car accident in 2015. So I was already myself, but then I got in a car accident and I was I survived because I was laughing and I was looking at my ex-boyfriend because I, I avoided an accident ahead of me and I was in a brand new Mercedes and I was like, I'm a ninja. I was giggling and laughing. And so my head hit and it still took me uh, six months to think, two and a half years to recover from that. I couldn't do anything. I used to be really good at science and math and I'm not anymore. That's okay, I'm alive. But these little tiny moments in life, they just accumulate and you realize like I could die tomorrow. And yeah. if I am not true to myself today, then I will have wasted this beautiful thing that we call life. What's well, interesting um, because yeah. I think Steve Jobs said that one of the best evolutionary things is death. Like death forces us to think of our mortality and like it's, it's not what I'm going to do tomorrow. What do I have to do like right now? And I feel like yeah. that's very much like I kind of have the same sort of thing. I always think about that, but like maybe too well, much. Well, it's like but. it's now, but it's also like if I do get to live five more years, what is it that I can do between now and five years? And so right. that's where I get to plan like the stories and the books. And so I plan it out and I'm like, I really hope I don't get another car accident, right. you know, and I, I hope every, if everything works out, I'm going to do that book. I have my entire life planned out on fun things that I'm going to do every five to 10 years. Um, and new things happen. Mm -hmm. I've tried to commit suicide in my life uh, twice. And both times, I, I didn't do it, obviously. I mean, I didn't go fall. It didn't work. Whatever I did didn't work. Um, the first time, I was like 11. And like that very next month, I got um, in my youth group, I became like the, the head person in my youth group. Mm -hmm. And then all these people were there, and they were celebrating me. And I was like, I'm the youngest like leader in this youth group. That's amazing. I should keep going. Something happened in my 20s. And then I remember um, a couple months later, something amazing happened. And I was like, wow, I'm so happy I didn't go. Like, right. How, how dark can things be? And so now I hold that, right? You got that darkness. But when there's that deep darkness, that only means that the, it's only can get brighter. And maybe it's not tomorrow. And it's maybe it's not for another year or two or five in some cases, but there's these ups and downs, which is why mm -hmm. I study story so much. Mm -hmm. You get to look at these lives, you read these books and you watch an entire character's life and you get to see these moments where they they could have gone and then they go up and they go down and that's the kind of like, and now I'm writing stories for other people to explore right. that. And it's just like all of that, well, all think... of that is why I'm so me. But I think I think it's interesting you say that. I have a friend who's a counselor, and she was telling me that in her counseling, she will often use the hero's journey, mm -hmm. and she'll use it as like a, a, as a way of saying, "Look, life. Let's let's look at your the last five years of your life, okay? And let's see. This is a low point, right? All right, we agree. Like your your father passed away, or you know something happened, or whatever. This is a low point. Let's go back six months. Let's look at a year, and then they see there's actually an arc where it goes up but backward and then they say but wait a minute let's see if we can find another dip and then they find another dip and they're like well let's keep going and see if we can find another up and so through using kind of like that journey and saying oh well what did you learn from between this dip that dip and this arc upward like yeah how did you change and how did you get stronger or better or become different or or whatever and when people see that looking backward they yes. have an easier time 
imagining how that could also happen in the future, which is how kind of like it's a tool that she would use to help, you know, show yeah. that. There's this funny thing. So like everything in my life I appreciate, just everything I'm appreciate. I appreciate talking to you. I appreciate breathing. I appreciate everything. I appreciate this little kitty cat, um, you know, and it's like, some people, I, I don't, I don't know if it's because of all my ups and downs that I'm so appreciative. I live in this beautiful house. I lived in LA for 14 years in tiny places. I've been homeless twice, mm. uh, once when I was 18 and then again when I was 28. And, you know, I've made six figures and I've made nothing. You know, I've gone, I've, I've experienced the gamut of it yeah. all. Yeah. You know, I've been alone in, in solitude and I've been around thousands of people. And um, I, there were times that I, I felt like I just could not do anything right. And other times it was just abundance of yeah. wonderful and I'm just producing like crazy. And I think like, you know, there's a, I keep coming back to, I don't know why, but I love Kurt Vonnegut and this mm -hmm. book Bluebeard is doesn't just everybody love it though. so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just watching the life of a person, and I like watching those. Um, Bill Murray had a was in. A, it's like one of his only serious films, where uh, where the was, Buffalo Rome? Is it no. that one where he know. goes to the military and then it's like he's like in love with this girl? I love watching these. Um, I don't know what they're called. The Razor's Edge. The, the an Razor's adaptation Edge. That's the of, one. It, there are yes. like three people in the world it's, that's seen it. You, yes, that's me, you and me, and then probably <laughs> Bill Murray like has seen it. He made that. He he agreed to do Ghostbusters if the if they would fund Razor's Edge based on the novel by William Somerset Maugham. Oh my God! Yeah, so it's it's actually a very good for anyone out there. It's an underrated film. So I'm so sorry to interrupt. What were you saying about Razor's Edge? Um. So. I love watching these because you get to see what reality looks like, that there are situations in your life that are so dark that you're like, there could never be a tomorrow. But you watch these movies and you read these histories of people and you're like, there's always a tomorrow until there isn't, which mm -hmm. is that's life. There is Eventually there is not going to be a tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But in this span, like what can you do? So for me, that teen, my purpose in life is to collect all the, ex the stories and, and all the experiences and jam pack them into this one crazy life. Do you find, and this is my own personal thing, but I, cause I've had, you know, dark times in my life too. Like I think not everybody, but maybe some people, but I find that the older I get, maybe the either the more maybe i'm more prepared for them or maybe i'm more understanding of those multiple arcs in life or but do you find that they are easier to deal with or do they are they the same just in They're i mean it's a weird for question, me but. no no that that's actually a good question so i just turned 41 and i got a lot of experience under me and there it's money is the one money mm -hmm. is the thing where you're like oh god but for some reason that doesn't like it, it would make me sad to not have money to do the things that I like and have mm. the things that I have. But I know that I am so creative mm -hmm. and I'm just always I'm just like an inventor. I'm just always inventing new stuff and weird things to do that. That's always going to be a lull because it, there's a point where maybe that's just me developing something so that I can go and do something right. and then I can find money um, for those things. So it, I, I know what I'm capable of now, so it's not as scary to me. Right. It just means you got to tighten up a little bit until you hit that, that, that upward momentum again. Right. And yeah. And I think the good thing about the older we get, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I feel that I can make up for my youthful like energy just in my amount of knowledge. So whereas when yeah, I was yeah. 25, it would take me three years to do some successful project. But now, I'm not saying I could do this necessarily, but it takes me five months because I, I yes. know I can kind of like cut off at the pass all those mistakes yes. I might have otherwise made. Um, yeah, not, not exactly. Always. You are more efficient the, more, yeah. the older you get because 
I mean, boy, I made a lot of mistakes, but mistakes are good. Yes. I don't remember who said it. They were like, the more failures you have means that the more you've tried to do something. Right. And eventually it hits. Like Elon Musk, how many companies did he invest in and create before Tesla? Yeah. SpaceX. Yeah. You know, and I think he actually talks about that. Um, I really like um, TED Talks and um, the Tim Ferriss show. Those are also about like people and their lives and like this, their stories. What yeah. do you, um, let me just ask you a final question here and no pressure, but um, if you could kind of sum up, like if you were like when you are going to be like 80 years old and you look back on Satine Phoenix's hero's journey, what do you, can you tell us in like three acts, what would it kind of be or no pressure um, or we can just cut to black. No, no, no. This is good. This is good. What do you think? So, who would your, who would your threshold guardians be? Who would your, <laughs> your allies be? Um, okay. I got this. Mentor, I got this. Mentor, all mm-hmm. that stuff. So in very truncated, short, concise. Of course. Um, first it was outward expression uh it, no no at first it was um so superficial exploring the superficial needs of humanity mm-hmm. right the good looks the sexuality yeah and then and then i overcame that i overcame being the object of mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. gratification and then, uh, so that would the that would be at the uh, what I think I need to be for other people. Yeah. And then, it's um, charity. Mm-hmm. So, how much can I do for other people to help them? And then, I think it's going to be. Um, what can I create to inspire other people? Mm-hmm. I think that's a, that's going to be my my three main. Uh, what is that? That's a really good question. That works. Yeah. Sorry, I I didn't mean to. No, like... I love it. Are you kidding? Ladies me? and like gentlemen, really I sent these interview. questions in advance. She had plenty of time to think of an answer, so <laughs> don't blame me. But th- um, no, I I like yeah, no, that. that one. I would say that, that, I mean, that's the impression I get. Like, of course, it's difficult to know the real person and the YouTube personality and the person who talked to the interview. And, of course, we don't really know each other. But the impression and the feel I get, and I think I'm pretty good at feeling other people out just because I'm, I'm a teacher and I know what it's like to fake stuff too. Um, but I, the impression I get is that you are uh, like a helper. You're an enabler. And, and, and in, a, in a positive way. You, yeah, you are, absolutely. You, you help people sort of find these things and inspire. I like to create the space for people hmm. to um, be themselves. And so I do a European tour, and I'm really excited. Like, gosh, we're going out to the, in, to the international everything and want to get out into the world. Um, it's, it's, like, it's like ultimate dungeon mastering to create an event in Mm -hmm. a different country and watch people from six hours away all come to this event not for me i mean they might come because i'm like here i'm doing this event but so that they can meet each other right and they can develop podcasts and youtube shows and streams and games and i watch it it's like and i mean i do this i did this in la i would throw parties and sit people in different areas and just kind of sit back and you're a connector i love it i'm like a uh, emotional matchmaker yeah or a, a, you know like a, a role-playing matchmaker we, we need more of that right especially now that way i can walk away and then i get because yeah. i get messages every day hundreds of messages and i if if i can't read all of them i glance at all of them because some days like today is rough you know I'm, I'm just really busy but if i can just kind of glance and just see that somebody in singapore is doing this thing right um, Saudi Arabia, you've got Canada, you've got Scotland, and, and it's just you know a podcast, a live stream, and it, and then and then they like took a moment to breathe an energy out in my direction, and it's just like, how amazing is that? Yeah, 
Yeah, that is, it's pretty mind-blowing, right, to think that Ugh. you could affect somebody on the other side of the world and maybe it was just something you said or a gesture you made or, or maybe an idea you sort of set out there into the world. And someone else, it's like, like tossing a pebble in the pond, and, but it ripples all the way over to, like, you know, the other side of the world. Um, if I had more money, I would hire people to read through my um, – read through my emails so that I can and all my messages so that I could at least see everything in a very efficient way and mm. I'd probably develop an app to do that or something or you'd clone know. yourself like, so that then you could read all of the different things yeah. yourself right there yeah. you go and then you but could it's about, do so many projects but this is ultimate art right this is ultimate art it's communication and so by doing these live streams and throwing these events it's inspiring people to come and create and then what like like that that is being a true artist so i guess I, i'm an artist yeah I'm, you're I'm spreading the dream yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 well i want to thank you very much for for coming on uh i say this at the end of every program like i basically just cold email people and I basically <laughs> select people that like I've I've read their books or I've watched their shows or I listen to their stuff in some way, shape, or form. And I just send these out there. And and people don't have to. I mean, obviously, I'm a tiny channel. Uh, hopefully, at the point in the future where you're watching this, I'm in a humongous channel and I'm you're president humongous. of the world. That's but right. <laughs> now I'm now I'm tiny. When I'm saying this, um, so they're very. It's it's very kind of you to to volunteer your time. You you know you give me an hour and a half. I know you hopped on right after doing. Oh, that was stream. fun. Yeah, um, I didn't even notice. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. I thank you. I, I like to make it fun um, for for my guests, and and I appreciate your thoughts and insights. Um, so for those of you at home watching, I also appreciate you as as well. Thank you so much for, for hanging in there and, and listening. I apologize. I'm, I'm not the best person at multitasking. Like, I'm not always I, – I saw tons of stuff going on in the chat. Um, I was reading a lot of it, but I'm not a super good, like, multitasker. So Yeah, my I, computer died. Otherwise, it would have helped. Oh, no. Oh, that's all right. No, no problem. Because I actually saw uh, – I saw someone in there that I, I know. So I think that person was kind of helping to facilitate, too. But um, – so at any rate, everybody out there, if you did like what, what you saw tonight and what you heard, I, I hope you'll maybe like and subscribe and share and, and maybe create duplicate accounts and, and subscribe on those <laughs> too. And then maybe send this off to like a Russian troll factory and have them all like subscribe to it and things like that, you know? So, yeah, tell all your friends. That's yeah, how just it works. It runs the algorithms right up. But um, – Satine, thank you so much for, for coming on tonight. I do very much appreciate your time, and I wish you the best thank of luck you. with everything thank you do you so much. in the future. This is wonderful. Thank you thank so you. much. <laughs>